Well, friends, this morning we are going to turn to the Word of God, and our scripture passage is from Luke chapter uh, 16, beginning with the, are we doing okay with noise volume? Okay. We are doing uh, Luke chapter 16, beginning with the, the 19th verse, and we're picking up where we left off last week in a series of messages titled, That's a Great Question. So hear now the Word of God. It's a parable of Jesus. There is a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime, You received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Beside all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them. So they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses, the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they'll repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Let's pause for prayer. God, we, we praise you once again for this safe space where we can gather, bearing in mind, God, that your gospel always creates a safe environment for us, where we are known and loved by you and also valued by others because of your message of grace and mercy and hospitality. We thank you, God, for your word that speaks from generation to generation. And we pray, God, that your word today that was written in Luke 16 would be a living word to us somehow that in its own way it would speak to our own situation. We know it will, Lord God. We offer this prayer in the strong name of Jesus, the risen and the reigning Christ. Amen. Well, once there was an Englishman and he was on the train platform going from Edinburgh, Scotland to England and returning home, and there was a Scotsman there who said, "Um, excuse me, sir, Uh, are you from here, or are you returning somewhere? And the Englishman said, yeah, I'm actually from England, I'm going home. Scotsman says, well, tell me, how did you like Scotland? Englishman says, I hated Scotland. It's cold, and it's wet, and it's full of Presbyterians. (laughs) To which the Scotsman replied, well then, why don't you try hell? It's warm, it's dry, and there's no Presbyterians there. Boy, friends, I'm counting on it. One can only hope it's true. Today we are continuing our series of messages titled, That's a Great Question. And we are looking at different questions of faith that we can have throughout our lives that sometimes are not always readily addressed on Sunday morning because they require somewhat of a thorough treatment. And what we're wanting with this series is to get us thinking about some of these really important topics and to have our our minds stirred so that we can think about them maybe in a more critical way as we think about our faith. And last week we looked at the topic of heaven. And heaven is 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 a realm, as a domain that we experience today, but also the afterlife of the complete presence of good, the complete absence of sin and death and suffering and fear, 
um, and that God calls us to that place called paradise through us professing a faith in him. And we, today, we're looking at the place that is known as the opposite. It's called hell. Um, a domain and a reality, as I'll be referring to it. And it is, a, it is an important topic. It is one that Jesus addressed um, quite a bit in the New Testament. <laughs> and so it's one that, desi- that, that he uh, does not want us to witness <laughs> in our lives. And he spoke of it quite a bit. And so we're going to be going there today. And I do want to tell you that as we look at this topic, that it's one that often churches and church leaders don't address. And there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, One is it's it's difficult. It's it's not an easy one, is it? Uh, Also is over the decades, centuries of the church, um, way back when, and some of us have been a part of churches like this, it's used in a way um, that can stir fear in people's lives uh, in an unhealthy manner, with devoid of the message of love and grace and mercy. And so um, it's not often spoke of. And, and for me, I believe it is unloving for church leadership to not talk about this <laughs> because it is something that Jesus described, because it is a reality that Jesus does not want us uh, to experience in the life that is to come. So we're going to be looking at it in that way, in, in, a, in a present way as well, as it a, a really occurs in our own lives and how we can see this reality around us. We're going to be doing that by looking at a passage of Scripture. We looked at Luke chapter 16. This is a parable told by Jesus, and there's two main characters. So the first is this man named Lazarus. And just so you know, this is the only parable in the Bible where Jesus actually gives somebody a literal name. Um, And the name Lazarus means God is my help. Um, God is my helper, or I look to God for help, um, or otherwise described as God is my help. And it's sort of describing who this man is and what he's about. And he is a, he's a beggar. He's a, a rather depicted as a rather pathetic man. He's a beggar. He's got sores. The dog licks his sores. Um, and he is uh, in, in need of people to help, to help him as well. And he is not someone who has any potential of climbing the rung and being in high society. Then you have this other man who is rich. And the point of the rich man describing him as rich is less about him somehow being bad for being rich, it's actually just describing what the wealth in this case reveals about this man's character and what he's really about. Um, His view of other people, some of his own entitlement in life, and how this leads to a real breakdown and erosion of relationships. But there's a rich man here, and here in this passage, what happens is um, they die, they both die, and one of them goes to be with Abraham, which biblical scholars depict as entering into the heavenly banquet, to be with God's saints, to be with God. And then the other person, the, the rich man, so Lazarus goes there, and then the rich man goes to this place that is called Hades. And Hades, there's different languages, there's a lot of nuances to the language behind this, but largely in Hades, what is described is for people who receive punishment for sin in the afterlife, go there for a short amount of time, eventually they end up in this reality that is called hell. And we see this in the scripture in Revelation, which says the following. Um, See, he gave the dead in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead in them, and all were judged by what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown to the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. So it describes all who in Hades eventually end up in this place that is called hell. So as we think about this and, and what it is, Uh, we should know how it's being defined scripturally. Um, Hell is a place of judgment and punishment for sin in the afterlife. That's how it is described, and this is why the relevance of the cross in Jesus Christ and our need for a Savior. And hell is depicted in different ways. Sometimes it's depicted as this um, perpetuity. I'm having a hard time pronouncing words today. It's the hour of sleep. Thanks. Um, Thanks for the grace. (laughs) Excuse me. <clears throat> certain words just not coming to me today. Um, so that's why, that's definitely at least one. Um, so it, 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 some of it's described as, as just eternal, conscious of, of, of agony, um, a, a, con- a person consciously experiencing this agony in eternity. Um, and there's different ways of interpreting it where it, it goes on for a period of time. Hell itself is an eternal realm, um, but that there is, in fact, a, a complete death of a, of a person in this judgment and punishment of sin. And uh, there's different ways to, to see it. As we see what happens, as it's described in the Bible, hell, it's hard to imagine a soul surviving this for very long. 
Um, and so we have to consider that in, in our understanding of it and what's being described here. But as we consider this important topic, and as it relates to our faith, um, what's really important for us is to have a lot of humility around it. Um, because you and I are not in a place to judge who's in and who's out. That, that, is not, that, is the, that is the work of Jesus Christ. That is the work of God. We don't know ultimately what's in a person's heart. And we have to be very mindful of that and, and very careful. Um, and with all of our concern of who's in, who's out, channel that for a need of witness, for that people would know the living Savior, Christ, and to proclaim him in your life, to let people know in how you live your life, um, how you share your faith with other people, of the importance of Christ and the fullness of life that he offers as well, that Christ truly gives us the best way to live. But what I also want to say about this is there may not be anybody like this here, but we've met people like this, maybe some. Um, if, if a person's need for such a place, a, a punishment for sinners, is greater than their longing for heaven, I would describe that as a spiritual health issue. <laughs> we don't want this for people. We, we don't desire this for people. Our longing is for people to experience the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ, fullness of life, life eternal. We desire good for others. Yes, there is a sense in which we want justice satisfied. That's true. In this world, there's injustice. But we long for the good of our neighbor. And so we speak to this mindfully of that. But hell in, in Scripture is referred to in a few ways. And the first one you see in this passage and in Scripture is the complete absence of good. Um, that, that is this place in the afterlife. There's a complete absence of good. It is really hard for us to have an imagination around this because of the complete absence of good in, in any situation. And we all experience the widespread mercy of God. Whether or not you have faith in God, faith in Christ, we all experience uh, the presence of God in some way through all the good that God provides for people's lives. So that cup of joe that we all desperately needed extra cups of today to get us here on time for church, um, that enjoyment, that's, that's, a, that's good. That's a, that's a good from God. <laughs> God offers that to us. Um, that that is, describes a, a part of God's good. The relationships you enjoy, the work that you enjoy, when you're out in creation, all of this. And none of this is really of credit to you. It is all good that comes from God. And so it's hard for us to imagine a place of the complete absence of good. And Tim Keller says, you know, when, when Jesus refers to flames um, and metaphor of fire in the Bible um, as being torment, Keller says, actually, when Jesus uses a metaphor like that, the, the truth behind the reality is far, far worse. And that's because the complete absence of good, it, it's having imagination of what this would be like. <laughs> of no good at all whatsoever. And what's interesting is you kind of see this in this passage. There's a, a scholar from Cambridge University who says about this passage, gives a really interesting insight and nuance to this passage. And that is the way that you see kind of the, the reality of hell or absence of good in the rich man. Do you notice that when he's in the afterlife, he's still trying to boss Lazarus around? <laughs> he thinks he's better. It's this breakdown of relationship of good. It was the way he lived his life in real life, which is this absence of good, of treating someone, of, of demeaning, of turning up your nose to somebody and believing you're better, that carries over. Um, and he still has it. But then he's in this place of complete absence of good where it says there's, there's agony and he comes to terms of just how bad he's been. But he's, he's hung on to this absence of good, but it continues uh, in, this, in this eternal realm. And it's describing... The absence of good. <laughs> and essentially, what a, a, a Christian teaching around this is, is we can communicate not desiring to have God a part of our lives. And what this reality was for the rich man is God going, okay, well, you're, you don't want good in your relationships. You don't want to look toward me as your help, um, live your life around me, as you wish. <laughs> as you wish. And that's kind of starts describing this reality, even in just who Lazarus was in, in, his, in his former life. But for us to think about the absence of good, there are actually things we can look at in this world to get a handle on what this might be like. And the way I see it is from some of my experience through missions. I've been to a few places and served abroad. One of them is Honduras. And uh, it's, it's the so-called third world. And uh, it's a, it's a, it's a 
poor place, right? Um, there's corruption and levels of government. There's the, there's the cartel wars. And so when I go there, we, when I went there, we would stop in Tegucigalpa. And as soon as I get to Tegucigalpa, I'm mostly ready to leave Tegucigalpa. Uh, it's the capital. And uh, one of them actually, for different reasons than maybe most people, I just don't like the way they drive. <laughs> Um, it's like New Jersey drivers on steroids. I lived in Jersey for a while. I thought I could hang with the best of them. Then I went to Tegucigalpa. Um, so Tegucigalpa, there's just not a lot of road rules, and it, it's, it's a very uneasy, it's an uneasy place to be. But as you're in Tegus, and we spend the night there before we go to a more rural village, there is around the perimeter of the city a garbage dump. And families live there in huts. And this is an image of a child having breakfast. Um... Having, having food, that's a school. That's people teaching a school for children, preparing for school. That's, and it's this place that until you get there, it's pretty unimaginable. And then you get there and you go, oh, <laughs> absence of good. In, in this depiction of what that would be like when you get there. And of course, Honduras is still, there are helpers, right? There's helpers there and mission teams, and, and that's good. So there, there is that, right? And, and it's not outside of God's reach, but a sense, of, a sense of the absence of good. Another place that could be described like this on earth, quite apart from looking at areas in our own life, could be uh, an author named Nick Ripkin wrote a book. Uh, he, he's a missionary first. He's a missionary that went to Somalia for 25 years, served a lot of different places. And when he arrived in Somalia, he said... Um, I didn't know I could experience hell on earth the way that I did there. He said, it's just despair. There's no joy. It's just death and no resurrection. And for a number of reasons, the levels of corruption, the injustice, epidemics of rape of women, abuse of children, sickness, um, extremism, fighting, violence. And it just feels like a very, very hopeless place. Eventually, he finds hope there, and he wrote about it in a book called The Insanity of God, and also there was a, a movie made about this. But he said, that this, is, this, is devoid, this is devoid of good. <laughs> Eventually, he discovers the hope over the course of 25 years. So hell is described as the absence of good, but also, scripturally, it's described as uh, disintegration. That is another image used scripturally for, uh, for hell. And we see kind of this in the scripture passage where it says this. Um, he's, you know, the man says, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. So it's disintegration. Tim Keller points out this. Uh, Jesus uses the image of fire. Why is fire used so often in the Bible and talks about hell? Because fire is a place where things break down. <laughs> it's this idea, it's this notion of, of disintegration. And a way for us to think about that is, is to think more of present reality and I would think about this in the form of a vice. So a vice um, may be something, start out with something good, like, um, like dark chocolate, which is why I never fast from dark chocolate during Lent. I am much more sacrificial than that. I fast from green beans um, be, because some, some, somebody has to. Somebody has to. Um, so I'm doing that all for you so you enjoy more chocolate. But, um, but chocolate can be good, but... but Vice, you know, vice by virtue of it is, is, is being hooked to something, right? And when you have more and more of it, it requires more and more to have less and less fulfillment. Uh, there's a disintegration of enjoyment, and then it begins to absorb you or consume you. Now, you can take this with something more, more unhealthy as a vice. Um, let's say gossip. So for a moment, for, for those who, you know, and not all of us are, are perfect, so you, a juicy piece of gossip, you share it with someone, feels good in the moment because it gets you closer to them, they like you a little bit more, they know something they're not supposed to know. Initially, it's fine, then it becomes more of a habit. And what, what are you doing? You're doing something beneath your dignity and also the dignity of another person <laughs> as you're talking about that other person. And more and more, your dignity gets lost in that habit. <laughs> that just doesn't wear well. And you could, you could also take this to a, a higher form. Um, it could be in, in the form of, of, of disorder or perhaps an addiction to something like a substance where it becomes all-consuming to someone and the person as you knew them kind of disintegrates. You see, less, you, you see less and less of who they were. And that also is a description of hell. Mark Sayers is a professor that I studied under. 
um, for a year, and he describes this whole idea of losing yourself through what he calls hyper-reality. And he says the world we live in right now is, is hyper-real, and it's the idea that a lot of the world sells us on what's fake. So a, a base, it's the idea of, of consumer goods that we are all just consumers of things and experiences. And he says an ex example of this might be something as simple and harmless as toilet paper. So you're watching TV, and you see a commercial uh, selling toilet paper, and who do they have? Well, of course they have Prince Charming selling toilet paper, because otherwise people wouldn't be compelled, as compelled to buy it. Um, so Prince Charming is selling it, so if you buy it, the idea is you're either going to look like Prince Charming or you're going to be able to possess Prince Charming. But in the end, you just have a very basic product, but it's trying to sell this as something that's defining you, <laughs> that this is who you are intended to be, that this somehow really uh, matters. And he says we can kind of live in this world of, of, you know, a phone would be a good example. We swipe for the next app or social media platform and get absorbed in this world. And we know a lot of it, as we look at it, is kind of phony. And yet we get absorbed and consumed in it, right? And it's sort of this way in which we lose ourselves in something that's just, um, just purchasing or just buying or getting caught up in something that's like, no, this isn't what my life's about. What am I doing? And we have those moments of recognition. And for the man in the story, the rich man, what is his main area of disintegration that leads to a total breakdown in relationships? Which, by the way, social media can do when you're absorbed in it. Just distance from God, distance from others sometimes. And what, what happens with this man? Well, it's, it's the riches. He finds comfort in that. He's so sophisticated. He's a little more important. So, you know, he's a little closer here to to God, maybe, because he feels like he's important and somehow has earned that good and right to be um, fa receive favor from God. He believes um, he's better than Lazarus. So it leads to this disintegration of relationship. It, it's this distancer <laughs> and ultimately can cause someone um, to lose their sense of, of dignity. And that's what hell describes. And you can see this sort of happen in life today. Um, and that's what it describes as well for the afterlife is disintegration. But finally in this passage, and this is where I want us to land and, and really think about this for our own personal lives. And that is, while it's certainly true that Jesus Christ came to redeem us from sin and death and deliverance from this reality that is called hell, that we needed a Savior, um, Jesus is equally concerned about removing hell from you and from me and from this world. And that is a primary message of Jesus. As John Orberg puts it, um, Jesus wants to put hell completely out of business <laughs> in this world and in our life. And he cares about that. And when you look at the, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 through 7, the Beatitudes, it starts describing that what Jesus wants is to remove hell from inside of our lives. Like when he talks about lust, what does he say? He says, he talks about adultery, and he says, well, yeah, adultery is awful, but it, it's this lust in our hearts. That's hell. Like that, that's hell, <laughs> that we experience that. It's beneath our dignity, and it's in our heart. That's hell. With, when it comes to murder, what does he say? When you have hatred towards someone. He says murder is bad, but it's when you call someone, he uses a word for idiot in, in that passage. When you call them the raka, you call them idiot. That's, that's where the murder starts, and he looks at the human heart. And Jesus really cares about that. He, he, he's getting at our heart and removing hell from my heart and from yours and from this world. Because ultimately, what we want in this passage is to identify with Lazarus. How? God is my help. <laughs> God is my salvation. God is my hope. And we cling to him to, to remove hell even from our own lives. And you may think about this in your life today. Do you have some areas, <laughs> maybe some dark corners of your heart? Maybe Christ can look at. Maybe a little bit of hell. Maybe it's a vice that's just kind of gone topsy-turvy. You've gotten carried away with it. You need to turn to Christ for healing and, and for support and for maybe for accountability to be whole again, <laughs> to experience that, to get hell out of you. Maybe, it's, maybe you have a hard time with forgiveness and you're bearing resentment. That's a hell. Walking around with bitterness in your heart of an anger towards someone that just pops up in those private moments in your day where you just grit your teeth. You're like, Ugh. 
turn toward God for, for mercy and for grace and, and to fill our hearts. It could be in an area like regret. <laughs> you need God to help you to let go of something. It could be being a, a person who views a, a scarcity point of view where God's calling you to abundance and you hold, you know, they're a little tight-fisted. Maybe it's in a breakdown in a relationship. You, you know that you can be that person. You can be that reconciler to remove hell from a situation. And God's calling you to do that. <laughs> God's calling you, to, wanting to put you in that place to bring a little more heaven in this world. And when I'm honest with myself, boy, I can see at times in my own life. Remember last week we talked about how sin lives in us, but it doesn't reign in us? <laughs> yeah, I can have those moments, those moments of frustration. Every now and again during my week, if I'm honest, I look back at something from way back then that I regret, and I just go, oh, God, I just don't want to even think about this anymore. I just want to let go of it. And it's hard. And like you, I'm a work in progress. <laughs> I'm letting go of it. I can have moments of resentment where I just stop in the quiet of my day and I just, my mind just free flows and I, I go back maybe to an individual and I go, uh, boy, not always positive thoughts. I can go there. You know, sometimes with those that I, I struggle with even, I'm aware of this. I just go, well, I'll, be, I'll just be quiet. I'll just sort of be silent. And what I do is, in my own way, withhold words of encouragement. It's a way of communicating that to another individual. That's hell. That's hell. You ever experience hell in your heart? <laughs> Boy, Jesus Christ, he wants to remove it. <laughs> he wants to take that from our hearts, friends. And you know, Jesus Christ is calling you not only to have hell removed from your heart, and removed from your life. He's calling you as well to look at this world. You ever see pockets of hell around you? Situations that appear to be completely devoid of good? In a sense, maybe, that you can do something about that, that you can step in, that you can be that person. I think Christ really cares about that. Removing hell from this world getting more heaven inside this world. I'm thinking about this this week, and there's a person I'm looking after right now, and I, I can't share details because of confidentiality. It's not a member of our church even. It's a family member, a young man I'm looking after right now. I spent a lot of time with this week. And he's, uh, he's going through a hell. <laughs> he's too young to completely understand, understand that he will as he gets older. I'm making sure he gets a little more encouragement. That he understands he's not walking through that alone. And he'll have that memory of never walking through that alone. It's just this erosion breakdown of relationships in his life. And I'll tell you, we're all called to do that. Identify those pockets of hell. Adopt them. And take them on in your own life. Because Jesus Christ did what? As we learn from a, a very famous creed of the church called the Apostles' Creed, he descended into hell <laughs> after the cross those three days. Went to those dark places. And you know, he, he did that not merely to keep us out of hell in the afterlife. He did that to model something for you and for me. Ephesians 3 tells us he descended into the depths of the earth. <laughs> he does that to model something. That you and I would dare to go to the dark places of this world to remove heaven or to, to remove, rather, hell, <laughs> and to bring heaven. And friends, God calls us to do that. And here's the hard truth about that. When you do it, it's going to bum you out a little bit. <laughs> it's a bummer. It's hard to enter into these places. Jesus Christ models it. And he calls us, friends, to do it too. And, you know, as we think about this scripture, <laughs> I just want to return to this thought that all of us are in need of a Savior to do this in our lives, to do it for others, for this world. Jesus Christ. And ultimately, what we want in this scripture is to identify with this man, Lazarus, whose name is God is my help. He is my helper. He is my hope. And I believe it is the deep longing of every person of faith 
to desire this to be a profession of faith for all, that they would know the living Savior, Jesus the Christ.